Well, tonight's the night, and it's gonna happen one more time. Welcome, everybody, to my Dexter Antagonist ranking. Now, if you have not seen my previous content, or if you're just now finding me for the first time, over the past year, I have reviewed every single season of Dexter in full. I reviewed every single episode of Dexter New Blood as it aired, did about a 30 minute talk about the finale and my extreme disappointment with that. And then I did a hour and 20 minute or so exploration of the entire season, as well as a ranking of all nine Dexter seasons just a few days ago. And now for my final coverage of Dexter until maybe one day there's more Dexter to talk about is gonna be my ranking of all of his antagonists. Now that includes all of the main villains of every single season, as well as a few of the side villains, providing that they are an actual threat for more than one episode, because there's a ton of individual characters that Dexter takes out within an episode, and this ranking would be five hours long if I went over all of them. So people that have a multi-episode or a multi-season arc, and this does include good guys, that just happened to go against Dexter, such as Dokes, such as LaGuerta, such as Angela from New Blood. So anybody from Dexter's perspective that is an antagonist will be in this ranking, of which I have 18 characters to talk about. So if you're a Dexter fan, hit the subscribe button, check out all that previous content. Please let me know your ranking down below. Now, starting off at number 18, for me, the weakest by far of all of Dexter's antagonists has got to be Lewis Green. Now, this is a character that was very intriguing when they first introduced him in season six, right towards the end. There's this whole subplot going on with Masuka where he's trying to get an intern and he starts training different people. And there's this uh, plastic hand that was from the ice truck killer case that starts to get tossed around in the mix. And Lewis Green comes in in the back half of the season, becomes this model intern, and then there's a couple of reveals in the last episode or so showing that he's actually the one that bought the hand and he's sending it to Dexter. What does it mean? What is this? What does he know about Dexter? Is he another brother? What's going on? So much intrigue was built at the end of season six leading into season seven about who this character is, what his issue with Dexter is, and where is this going? Well, within two episodes of season seven, he's shot in the fucking head. <laughs> it, was, it was all just a build up to pretty much nothing. He's an angry, bitter, manipulative little hacker that has a video game that Dexter doesn't like and he gets all pissy about it and has this little vendetta where he starts canceling his credit cards and shit like that. And ultimately, all it really does as far as propelling the plot forward is give the ability of Isaac Serko to be able to find out the identity of Dexter. I mean, it was just a multi-episode arc, a multi-episode buildup for the tiniest of plot advancement. And I mean, just by the end of it, he, he's by far the weakest person that Dexter has ever gone across. I mean, even if I did include all of the Freak of the Week characters, he would still probably be in the bottom five. Number 17 is gonna be George King, also known as the Skinner, the secondary villain of season three. And this is a guy that gets a lot of hate towards season three, just because of his character and the way that he's utilized. He's made out to be the big bad of the season when he's really this minuscule little side villain that just happens to pop up here and there, mostly to advance the plot of Deb and her boyfriend Anton, and then at the very end of the season, give one extra little antagonist for Dexter to take out before he gets to his wedding. I like the way that he's utilized because to me, Miguel Prado is easily the biggest villain of season three. He's the focus. So I don't mind having a smaller little side plot. It doesn't really detract from the season for me. But if you're looking at him as an individual villain, there's not a whole lot there. There's not a whole lot there as far as character development, as far as motive development. He's just this guy that skins people. And the only person of merit that he skins is Anton, who by the end of season four, by the middle of season four, honestly, becomes a character that we quickly forget about and never talk about again. Number 16 is the brain surgeon Oliver Saxon, or the weakest by far of the main villains of the entire run of Dexter. This guy, uh, one of the many, many, many problems of season eight. I think that there was an interesting enough idea on paper for where they were going with this and his ties to Evelyn Vogel and all of that, but I'm not even really a big fan of Ellen, Ellen Vogel as a, a character. So he comes in, there's these killer that's scooping out a little piece of people's brain and he keeps sending it to who ends up being his mother. And despite the fact that this guy really does affect Dexter's life in arguably the most uh, significant way since the Trinity Killer, 
as a character, as an on-screen presence, as a villain, he's just weak. There's, there's nothing intriguing about him. There's nothing that really stands out about him. You never feel intimidated by this guy. I mean, you just want Dexter to break his fucking neck every single time that he comes on. He's got that, that little shit-eating grin and everything. Just, no. I don't like anything about this character. I don't like the way that he's utilized. And the fact that they wrote in the whole thing about him being the one to actually take Deb out and take her out in the dumbest, most unsatisfying way possible. No. Could have been a good villain. The execution, horrible. Number 15 for me is Angela Bishop from Dexter New Blood. Now, this is a character that is certainly on the good guy side of things. She's not doing anything wrong. I mean, she finds out all these things about Dexter. She does what a cop should do, so... She's completely in the right for everything that she does, but she's just not a very likable character for me. She starts off likable when she has this relationship with Jim Lindsay, all the way up to the point where she finds out his identity of Dexter Morgan and calls him on it and calls him on his bullshit and doesn't listen to any of his, his lies, any of his trickery. I love all of that. But after that point, which is about halfway through the season, she just becomes a cop. She's just the, the chief of police in this town, and that's the only shade of her character you see again. There's no emotional complications about her feelings with Dexter or Jim. There's no, you know, turmoil whatsoever. As soon as she finds out that he's Dexter, she, he's dead to her. She doesn't care about him whatsoever. And she's just on this mission to take down Dexter. And all of this stuff just gets dropped into her lap. It's so conveniently thrown together. And the fact that when you get to the finale, it turns out she is the one who actually takes down Dexter for better or worse, you know, with a little help from Harrison. And it's just not satisfying. You know, when we have eight seasons of characters that have earned the, the plot right to be able to take down Dexter and it's just this small town sheriff that we don't even really care for, at least I didn't care for, it's not a very satisfying character arc. So for all of the good guys, for all of the cops that pick up the scent of Dexter and go to take him down, for me, she is the least likable of all of them. Squeezing just barely ahead of her is Joey Quinn. Now, this is a character that was brought in in season three to pretty much replace the Dokes character, and he's a love-hate character for me. There's seasons where I think he's a scumbag, there's seasons where I think that he's actually developed a bit and he's a little more interesting, like season four, and even season five is a little bit half and half to where that's the season he's genuinely trying to take Dexter down, he feels like there's something going on, the circumstances regarding the death of Rita has his spidey sense going and he starts hooking up with another character who I'll be talking about a little bit later to try to take down Dexter to try to find out what is going on behind this guy what secrets is he hiding and he comes pretty damn close to taking him down just to completely abandon all of that you know Dexter helps him out by the end of that season and then that's the end of their rivalry that's the end of their turmoil all the way to the point where in season seven and Maria LaGuerta brings all this evidence forward and literally arrests Dexter and brings him through Miami Metro as a suspect for the Bay Harbor Butcher case. And Joey Quinn never stands up and is like, oh, yeah, all you motherfuckers thought I was crazy a couple years ago. Oh, shit, guess what? Mm, give me all the details you got on this case, please, because I got some shit I need to add. No, nope. he just gets relegated back to the dumbass kind of dirty cop at Miami Metro. Number 13 is Frank Lundy, a character that leads the FBI investigation into the Bay Harbor Butcher in season two, and then returns for the first half or so of season four to introduce all of us to the Trinity Killer. Now there's aspects to this character that I like. I think that he's very smart. That whole serial killer hunter aspect to him is really cool. I like the fact that he doesn't take any shit from anybody, including LaGuerta when she tries to kind of stick her hands in the cookie jar and he's like, bitch, this is my investigation. Get the fuck out of here. I love all of that about him. But I've always found him to be very weird. And I've always found his dialect and some of the shit that he says and talking about Chopin and cream cheese and cucumber sandwiches and his relationship with Deb is just off. I, I understand narratively where they're going with the daddy issues and the older man attraction and all that. Okay, fine. But it's just, it's he's such a weirdo that I've never really on board, been on board with his character arc regarding Deb, including their rekindled romance in season four just to end in tragedy. So I like the detective side of him but his actual human personality really turns me off. Number 12 is gonna be Paul Bennett, a guy who was a secondary antagonist through most of season one and was in, I believe, one episode of season two just on a phone call. And this was Rita's ex-husband, the violent drug addict drunk that used to beat her up and used to just terrorize her. And he comes back into the fray 
and slowly starts manipulating the legal system to try to get his kids back and to try to fuck over Rita. And he's constantly looking at Dexter like, hey, are you the one screwing my wife? And just, it tries to intimidate him. And I love the scene whenever he like goes to punch Dexter and Dexter's just like, just turns his cheek like, go ahead, bitch. We'll see what happens. So for a secondary antagonist, for the storyline of him trying to get in the way of Dexter's cover, and what eventually becomes his family life, I think that he's a pretty effective secondary villain. And I just like Mark Pellegrino. I think that he's great in pretty much any villainous role you give him. Number 11 is gonna be the doomsday killer, Travis Marshall. Now, on one hand, I think that the kills and the way that they stage the kills is amongst the most creative and amongst the most brutal of any of the kills in the entire series. And I like the, the religious aspect to the killings. I think that it adds a nice little darker flavor to this season. Unfortunately, the entire attempted plot twist about Travis Marshall and the professor being two different people when for me, within an episode, it was obvious that they were the same person and he was just his dark passenger like Harry is for Dexter. The fact that they attempted and completely fell on their face trying to execute that twist for me personally really drags down this character as well as drags down the entire season of season six. So there's a lot of different aspects to his character that I think he had the potential to be on the level of the Trinity Killer. He had the potential to be one of the scarier, one of the more intimidating, and one of the most brutal killers in this entire series. But the fact that they tried to get overly clever really bit them in the ass for this character. Colin Hanks' performance is good, and even if you want to count Edward James almost as a part of his character, his performance is good. It's all about the execution here, and the execution was sloppy at best. Number 10 is gonna be Stan Liddy. Now, admittedly, I just love Peter Weller, so maybe I'm a little bit biased to his character, but for as scummy and as dirty and as nasty as a person as this guy is, I think that he is a hilarious addition to season five. I think that him working with Joey Quinn is a nice little duality there where they kind of bond over being scumbags. And then as that season goes through and Joey is kind of growing as a character because of his feelings for Deb, and then he turns his back on Liddy. I like how Liddy affects Joey Quinn for that season. It's one of the few times where I really like how his character is advancing. And Stan Liddy gets really fucking close to figuring out who Dexter is. I mean, all the way through, if he didn't get a little bit too confident there at the end, he would have caught Dexter. He would have caught the Bay Harbor Butcher. He would have blown this whole case wide open just with a couple of security cameras, a couple of uh, CCTV hacks, and a zoom lens on his little fucking DSLR camera where he's looking at them dumping stuff off of the boat. So I think that the attitude and the nastiness of Peter Weller's performance is very fun. And I think that he's very underrated as an antagonist to Dexter because if he had just been a little smarter about it, he would have fucked Dexter's world up in season five. Number nine is going to be Jordan Chase, the head of the Barrel Girl murderers in season five. And I'm not talking about any of his friends or his lackeys because even though they, some of them are a story presence throughout the season, they pretty much all get taken out in each individual episode that they're in and they're not overly a threat to Dexter at all. So Jordan is the only one worth talking about in my opinion in this list. And he's a really interesting villain because He's the only villain that kind of takes a step back and is just doing mental manipulation on people. He's the one causing all of this pain, all this death, and all of the carnage regarding these barrel girls. But really, until you get to the last episode and he's forced to, to do something, he's not actually killing anybody. He's just making everybody else do the killing for him. And that's a really unique aspect to his character. I like the performance of Johnny Lee Miller. I think that he has the charisma of somebody that would be very believable as uh, a public speaker, as this, uh, this motivational speaker. And at the same time, when he gets dark, when he gets a little more twisted in the last couple episodes, you believe it. I think that that darkness comes out really well. Even in the scene where he realizes that somebody's tampered with his little blood vial and the way on his face, he's like, motherfucker, somebody knows. He just, it comes through really well in the performance. And I like the overall mystery of season five, where Dexter is taking on a ring of killers and slowly is trying to get to the head of the snake and finds out that it's one of the most famous people who's currently in Miami. It's just a really nice dynamic that is one of the better aspects of season five, which I'm a big fan of. Number eight is Maria LaGuerta. Now she was never an antagonist until season seven. I mean, she was always kind of a morally ambiguous character. 
you know, you never really got to see too much of her actual cop skills aside from pieces of season three and maybe a few sprinkled throughout the series, but she was always kind of like this political manipulator throughout the show where she would do things to move people around and get what she wanted any single time that somebody got in her way or she had her sights set on something. She was always much more of an antagonist for Deb and Deb's career. But then you get to season seven and right from the get go, she finds that blood slide and slowly starts to piece together the truth about who the Bay Harbor Butcher actually was. And it was not her friend and ex-lover James Dokes, it might actually be Dexter, this person that she has loved and defended in her, her department. And so season seven, one of the better aspects of that season is this vendetta that LaGuerta slowly builds towards Dexter because it's for the first time in the show that she actually is shown to be a very smart detective. And I think it's one of the only times in the show where they give a lot of very sensical, valid reasons for what these detectives are able to come up with. I've always had an issue with aspects of how much Deb was able to just figure out on her own, how much of these theories that she was able to come up with out of nowhere that were always 100% spot on. And LaGuerta, every little piece of info that she finds throughout season seven makes logical sense for her not only to find that, but for the inferences that she comes to after finding that. All the way to the point where she is literally manipulating criminals and killers and everything, trying to cause this snare trap for Dexter that inevitably gets her killed. So I think that of the detective characters, if it wasn't for the fact that she was such an unlikable character throughout most of this show, save for maybe season four where she has that romance with Batista, she would be much higher on this list. But if I'm going purely off detective skills, she was one hell of an antagonist for Dexter. Number seven is Kurt Caldwell, the main villain of Dexter, New Blood. And you know, I had hopes that this guy would rise up to like maybe the top three, maybe even top two, because I love Clancy Brown. As soon as they announced his casting as the villain, my hopes were sky high. I was like, holy shit, they might make the best villain ever out of this. And there's aspects to his character that I think we're heading on the road to being one of the best villains, but there's also a lot of convenient writing. There was also a lot of kind of derivative writing for his character that held him back a bit for me. Clancy Brown's performance is great. I love the reveal of his little museum of death where you know CP, my buddy, called him a bunch of Zoltar machines down in his little uh, shelter where he's got all of these women propped up like pieces of art that he has preserved. That was just wickedly creepy. One of the most eerie reveals that we've seen in this entire show, in my opinion. And I like the look of him when he's in his kill mode, whenever he gets that little snowsuit on with the mask and the sniper rifle and his whole like kill process where he tries to shelter them. Eventually they want to get out. He lets them go and then just guns them down so that he can preserve them and not let them get, you know, corrupted by the, the badness of the world when they're out on the road. I liked all of that, but the ultimate reveal of why he does that, because he saw his dad beat up a couple of hookers while he was on the road, was very weak to me. Aside from the fact that I loved that we finally had a villain that found out who Dexter was and manipulated Dexter and fucked with Dexter's life for episodes upon episodes, before ever letting Dexter know that he was on his trail, I loved that. I mean, he was sitting there like manipulating Harrison and trying to drive a wedge between him and his father for days upon days before they ever sat down and had that conversation about, bitch, I know you killed my son, by the way. And Dexter's like, oh shit, how do you figure that out? I liked that. But again, the writing, very convenient on how we got to that point. The explanation for how he found out that his son was dead compounded with the explanation of how he accused Jim Lindsay of being the killer. Big stretch for me, big logic stretch. And like I said in my season review, despite the fact that I like him as a villain, I think that he's also kind of a collection of ideas that's recycled. I mean, you have the whole thing about him trying to preserve his victim's innocence, which is one of the motivations of the Trinity killer when he's encasing these kids in cement. You have this whole aspect to him to where he is draining the blood in the first couple episodes of the season that is visually just like the ice truck killer to the point where all of us were having theories about, is he somebody related to Brian Moser? Is this another ice truck killer? What's going on? I mean, it was that eerily similar. And then you have you know him encasing all of these women in these little boxes and, and taking them off of the street and then you know, thinking that nobody's gonna come looking for them. It was very reminiscent of the Barrel Girls. So, I mean, there was just a lot of little 
details that were kind of cherry picked from other villains throughout these eight seasons that was kind of molded together to create Kurt Caldwell. So again, just like with the travel, Travis Marshall, the Doomsday Killer, I think that there was so much potential with this character that the writing and the execution kind of fucked up a little bit, but he's still pretty high on this list admittedly because I love Clancy Brown. Number six is Lila West. Now, I know a lot of people don't like her character because you're not supposed to like her character, and I think they get a little bit too uh, drawn into that Black Widow side of her and are kind of disgusted by her. Miss Pardon My Tits. They kind of take the dev approach where they're like, dude, she's a disgusting vampire. For whatever reason, I've always loved her character. I, I think that she is dangerously sexy. I think that the whole allure of her where she just draws people in and is literally just like a black widow spider and snaring this web around people to the point where she gets Dexter, she gets Batista, even all the other dudes in Miami Metro would have taken a shot at her. I mean, she is genuinely dangerous and terrifying. And to the point where just because she feels like Dexter is pulling away from her that she starts murdering people. She helps him kill Dokes or, or well helps him. She kills Dokes in hopes that it's going to absolve him of the case going on with the Bay Harbor Butcher. And uh, I think that's another reason why people don't like her because he gets she gets rid of Dokes, which I understand. But the whole aspect of her just being this vindictive, psychotic woman, the first time that he's had to endure a genuine, crazy relationship like that, where he's always kind of used a relationship with a girl as like a cover like he does with Rita and to finally kind of have that turned around on him to where he's actually being the victim in the situation to the point where she tries to burn him alive along with Rita's kids all of that shit that that's just wacky as hell to the point where I think that by the end of season two when she becomes the main antagonist I think that she is a damn good antagonist to close out that season. One of the many things about season two that is awesome. Number five, surprise motherfucker, James Dokes. Now this is a character that I, along with probably everybody else that watched Dexter, really wishes we could have gotten more of because he was just such an awesome person to go against Dexter. I mean, even whenever it wasn't a full on vendetta and he would just come up and have these conversations with Dexter at work where he would just flat out call him out like, you're a fucking weirdo, you know that? Like, what the hell's wrong with you? I loved all of those interactions with him and the fact that even Dexter acknowledges, he's like, yeah, you know what, I mean, you always saw through me. I never really held it against you. You're a good cop. That acknowledgement on Dexter's side, that mutual respect that they have each other, while knowing that one of them has to die to make this situation go away, was really captivating. All the way through season two, where he slowly starts to find out all these things, where he finds the blood slides and finds Dexter dumping bodies and all of that, and he's the one who first cracks the case of the Bay Harbor Butcher. James Dokes is just a badass. And I, I genuinely, as much as I love Lila, and as much as I love the explosive, no pun intended, nature of the conclusion of season two, I think that there was a lot of potential for James Dokes if they had carried him on throughout the show as maybe somebody that kind of understands and agrees with Dexter, being that he had a vigilante killing what season one where he just shot that guy that he saw from the war. There was a potential for him to be somebody within Miami Metro that knows that Dexter is this dark defender, that he is this Bay Harbor Butcher taking out the trash. And I think that would have been a cool plot development. I don't know how long they could have stretched that out, but he is, if any character in the show ever feels like there was potential for more and was just taken way too soon, it's James Dokes. Number four is Miguel Prado. Now, I seem to be in the minority who genuinely loves season three. I think the entire exploration of a friendship for Dexter, that whole journey that he goes on to where he's kind of taken aback by Miguel Prado's friendliness and his insistence to be friendly with Dexter, just to start to embrace friendship and let him into his dark world and teach him the code and all of this, just for it to go horribly wrong in the back third of that season. I think is one of the most compelling seasons of the show and it's one of the most compelling relationships that Dexter has had with one of his antagonists. And I just really love Jimmy Smith's performance in this role. I think that he nails both sides of the character, this really charming, cool, exciting, friendly DA, as well as this fucking whacked out psychotic egomaniac. And when he transitions from both of those within one scene, like the whole where he's trying to get permission to kill Ellen Wolf. And he's like, hey man, you know, I mean, you're a friend of mine. This chick's messing with my life. He's like, no, sorry, we can't do it. Well then fuck you. And he just loses his mind. I think that 
all of the per the dynamics of his personality and of the performance throughout the season is incredible. And that rooftop scene towards the end of the season where they just full on let each other know like, okay, we're, we're going to come to blows. Like one of us is gonna die soon. That entire sequence, one of my favorite sequences in the entire show. So I may be in the minority. I fucking love Miguel Prado. I think that that is an awesome season and he is an awesome character and easily one of the best antagonists. Before I give you guys my top three, please consider checking out my Patreon page. The link will be down below. That is my crowdfunding website for this YouTube channel. Patreon is the best and the most direct way to support me as a creator and to support this channel. If you enjoy this content, if you enjoy all of the content that you have watched thus far on my channel, please consider checking this out and looking at the different tiers available for financially contributing to this channel. There is a lot of exclusive perks. There's a lot of exclusive content that I try to give my patrons every single month. There is a monthly poll where they get to choose a video. I do exclusive Q and A's and live streams for them once in a while. So please, if you enjoy this channel, consider checking that out. And I appreciate your consideration for that. Now for the top three antagonists of Dexter. Number three is going to be Brian Moser, the ice truck killer, the OG villain from season one, Dexter's brother. Now, I admittedly have a lot of nostalgic love for this character because season one was just a season that grabbed me by the throat. As soon as I started watching this season, I became an absolute addict for this show. And I think that the way that they slowly unveil details about this killer, which is pretty much exclusive to season one. Every other season, we pretty much know who the killer is right away. They introduce us and it's all about how Dexter's gonna find out and how Dexter's gonna take this person down. Season one, Dexter is kind of the prey for the first time. The Ice Truck Killer holds all the cards. He knows who Dexter is. He knows that he's a killer. He, he's broken into his apartment. He knows all of his family members. And all throughout the season, he just starts dropping these little things for Dexter to find, these little hints, almost like a breadcrumb trail, eventually leading to the truth that Brian Moser is the Ice Truck Killer, who he knows as Rudy, and he is his long lost brother that he has forgotten about through trauma. And I think that the way that they reveal all of those things is paced out really well, it's executed really well. When you have something like season six as your opposite thing to contrast with, a very bad execution of a plot twist, I think season one does a masterful job at hiding the truth of who this killer is. And by the end of it, his motivation is really interesting. I mean, he just wants somebody to be his brother again. He just wants somebody to kill with. He wants somebody to be like him that he can feel like he's not alone in the world with, which very much is something that Dexter wants, but eventually he realizes that he loves his foster sister, Deb, more than anything he's ever going to get from Brian. And even just the tragedy of when he slits his throat and kills him, like the ice truck killer victims were always done, it's the only time that he takes out a main villain of a season that feels sad and feels tragic. And so all those different things that make Brian Moser and season one very unique, I hold in high regard, and that's why he's one of my favorite antagonists. Number two is Isaac Sirko. This is a bad motherfucker. Now, I know some people don't really hold season seven in very high regard, which is strange to me. I think it's one of the best seasons of the show. I think him as a character is not only one of the most compelling, but one of the most charming and one of the most intimidating villains that Dexter has ever gone against. And there are so many different shades to his character that I think he's one of the most fleshed out and one of the most complicated of the characters that have gone against Dexter, Dexter to the point where he's captivating for me every time he's on screen. He just seems like this Russian mobster with a vendetta at first, and he is very good at executing that vendetta. I mean, he's huge, he's strong. I mean, this is Ray Stevenson, this is the Punisher. And there's a sequence where he goes into a bar and kills everybody in the bar. It's like one against seven that makes him into this bad motherfucker. The fact that he's sitting in Dexter's apartment with all these tools laid out and his gun just waiting for Dexter to come home is just so sly and badass. But even after Dexter and him know that they're going for each other and they have these little phone conversations, he's just so calm and calculated and charming with the way that he interacts with Dexter. And I love the fact that in the back you know, episode or maybe two of his arc in season seven, he actually grows an appreciation for Dexter. They have a little bit of a mutual understanding and a mutual respect for each other. And they kind of go out as friends. And that's something that you never see. And that's something you wouldn't have expected when the season started. I mean, when you have that whole scene in the bar to where he's kind of giving Dexter advice on how to deal with Hannah McKay, 
and how to interpret his love and how to express his love by telling him that the person that I loved, like you loved Hannah, you cut up and dropped into the ocean. It's just a very complicated scene. And the fact that he says like, you know, if it was under different circumstances, we could have been great friends. I love villains like that. I love villains that are complicated and aren't necessarily the bad guys in the situation. They just happen to be against our main character. And I think as far as characters that are not just full on evil, that kind of have that complicated nature to them, he's by far my favorite. Then of course, at number one, did you expect it to be anybody else? It's Arthur Mitchell, the Trinity Killer. Not only the best villain antagonist in this entire series, but one of the greatest villains in TV history. All around the board, from the performance of John Lithgow, who just continues to amaze at his diversity and his range as an actor and how well he can play somebody evil, to the storyline and the lore that's built around the Trinity Killer, where Frank Lundy comes into town, somebody having their artery cut in a bathtub, somebody seemingly committing suicide by jumping, and then somebody being bludgeoned with a hammer all in quick succession over and over and over again throughout the years all around the country. It's just such a wicked and crazy explanation for like the modus operandi of this killer. And the fact that in, within the lore of this show, when you take into account how many people Arthur Mitchell's, Mitchell's killed, he might be the most prolific serial killer in American history within the lore of the show. That in and of itself is like a, a big dick to swing around as a villain. The whole explanation for why he does this, trying to recreate the deaths of his family members while eventually revealing that he also murders children and tries to preserve their innocence in a way to kind of forgive himself and preserve his own innocence as a kid. All of that was just so wonderfully written to where there was no piece of this guy's storyline, whether it was him, his family, his motivations, the killers, the victims, all the way up to the shocking finale of him getting over on Dexter right before Dexter takes him out was just the best written person, the best written villain in this entire show. To the point where season four and the Trinity Killer was so fucking amazing that even really good seasons later on in the show, like season five and season seven, pale by comparison. Season four set the bar so high that even great seasons of television felt disappointing by comparison. That is how incredible the Trinity Killer is. And I mean, you could tell how much fans love this character by the fact that they teased that he was going to be returning in Dexter New Blood and everybody lost their shit. Even though he's dead, even though it's just gonna be a flashback or it's just gonna be a hallucination, the fact that we get to see John Lithgow back as Arthur Mitchell in a season of Dexter was gonna be off the charts amazing just for him to be in one fucking scene. Why would you advertise that? No more ranting about Dexter New Blood. Trinity Killer. Arthur Mitchell, absolutely number one, best Dexter villain, best Dexter antagonist of all time. Well, that's it guys. That is my ranking of all of Dexter's antagonists. Please let me know down below what your list is. If you want to go crazy and put all of the individual episode villains, all the little freak of the week characters in here as well, and have a big fat ass ranking, go ahead and do that as well. Or you can just do the main villains of the eight, or excuse me, nine seasons if you choose to. But let's talk some Dexter villains, some Dexter antagonists down in the comment section below. Also, if you enjoyed this ranking, my buddy CP also did a video talking about his top 10 favorite Dexter adversaries, uh, Dexter villains, along the same lines, same rules, same criteria that I'm doing this uh, video. And he actually includes a couple of characters in his list that I never really found to be uh, adversaries of Dexter. So for a very different opinion, please check out the link down below and check out his video and tell him that Cody sent you. Subscribe, support his channel as well, please. Thank you guys for watching. Please like and share this video to help it get shared around. Hit that subscribe button if you're a fan of Dexter. Check out all of my backlog content. We're still probably going to do maybe one more video talking about Dexter if I can squeeze in the time for it where maybe I'm gonna pitch my idea for how I would have ended the show. So potentially that's gonna be coming within the next week. But regardless, I have a lot of Dexter content that's already backlogged on this channel that you will enjoy. So thank you guys for watching one more time. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.